At the most fundamental level, all computer programs can be represented with three basic constructs, and most computer programming languages provide adequate facilities for these. So these three constructs relate to the idea of sequencing, decision structures, and loop structures. So we'll talk about the, each of these briefly in this lecture, and then we will cover each one in turn in more detail. So sequencing is the most basic structure, and all that sequencing refers to is a linear action of one statement or one programming expression after another. So on the right, you can see these blocks. Each might represent a particular type of code that's being executed one after the other. So sequences of incoming events that are being processed. You can think of this even in an everyday example as a sequence of your morning routine. So you may wake up, then turn off your alarm, eat your breakfast, brush your teeth, shower, get dressed, and then pack your book bag. Or you could do some of those in different order. Maybe you shower before you eat your breakfast, or you brush your teeth, you know, right before you leave. But in any event, each one of those steps is done in some kind of atomic action by itself, and one follows after the other. So if you remember the, the example from the last lesson where we looked at drawing a square in SNAP, that's an example of a series of sequences of statements that would draw a square. Another popular and very useful decision structure is a decision statement, often called an if or if else statement. And whenever we write a program, our software often needs to make a decision. So based upon the state of a program, what, what's a certain value of, of something entered by the user? For example, a piece of tax software where you have the age of the person using the software determining certain things about tax brackets or salaries. And you have to make a decision. So anytime that our program needs to make a decision between two alternative paths, then a decision structure is very useful. So on the right here, you can see as a picture of coming down from a particular sequence, we then break into two paths that are evaluated by some decision structure. So the decision structure, structure evaluates the true or false, and we take one of two paths based upon that. So you can look at these examples here in English on the far left. If a certain condition is true, then I take one path, process A. Otherwise, I take the second path and I process B. In a more common example here in English on the right, if the weather is raining, then I wear my boots. Otherwise, I wear my sandals. So there's an evaluation there where I have to be able to check on the state of the weather. And depending on the value of the weather, I take one of the two alternatives. I either wear my boots or I wear my sandals. It may be possible that there's a situation where only one path is executed. So in this case, it's be just an if statement. So if my car needs gas, then I get gas. So there's no expression here of what happens otherwise. So if I don't need gas, I don't say anything about that need. I just only get the gas when the need arises. So if statements are used to test the conditions and it requires some kind of comparison. So if I have a value, I have to understand how that value relates to some decision need that I have. And we have operators in our programming languages that help us with that to be able to make these decisions and to express those decisions as we have need. And it's very useful if we can compose these decisions. So if it is raining outside and I have my umbrella, then I go one way, other, otherwise else I go some other path. So if I can compose my expressions, I have more power. So we'll talk a little bit about that coming up as well. So relational operators are the things that we use to express the decisions needed in a decision structure. And the common operators would be less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than or equal, equal or not equal. So these are all operators that evaluate to true or false by providing two different operands. So the operator in the middle, and we'd have two operands on each side of the operator, and we would evaluate that and get a result. So for example, five greater than four is true. So we have the operand five, the operand four, and the comparison is being done by the operator greater than. So it's often useful, and this is also true in mathematics, to be able to know the operator precedence. So what's the difference between two plus three times four compared to the parenthetical two plus three 
times 4. So the precedence is very important to understand the semantics of the computation. So if we don't understand the precedence, we may achieve the result that's not what we were expecting. So the concept of operator and precedence has a very high importance in understanding how our programs would run. So we have the highest level of precedence from our parentheses down to unary operators. Multiplication and division is a higher precedence than addition and subtraction and so on. So here are a few examples of what we mean by comparison operators. So if I were to ask you, is it true or false that 5 is less than 7? That's obviously true based upon the semantics of the less than operator and the values of the two operands 5 and 7. 3 greater than 9, that's, that's false. 5 less than or equal to 4, that's also false. But 5 is greater than 4, so that's true. Some other examples, now if I place in parentheses 5 plus 2 less than 7, so that's really saying 7 is less than 7, so that's false. 3 is greater than 3, that's false as well. But 5 times 4, 20, is greater than or equal to 4 times 5, 20. So the equal sign here allows this to be true. Otherwise, if it was just greater than, it would be false. And then 5 divided by 2 is greater than 4. So if we evaluated that to 2 and a half greater than 4, that would be false. So one of the things that is really useful about computer science is the ability to use, this, use computer science as a platform to teach more about logical thinking. So Boolean operators are the fundamental things we've been discussing in terms of the ability to make a decision statement. And these are attributed to George Boole, a famous logician and a philosopher and mathematician. So you can find a quote here as well as a Wikipedia entry for students who may want to find out more about who George Boole was and the relationship towards his contributions in logic and mathematics. But the logical operators are and, or, and not. So we looked previously at relational operators that would compare the relationships of two operands. So those operators would tell us how those operands work in comparison or in relation to each other. These logical operators allow us to compose other sub-expressions. So and would be able to take for us uh, two different expressions and by whether each of the two sub-expressions are true and or also would be whether or not one of the two sub-expressions is true, and not would then just negate the truthfulness of a particular statement. So the precedence would go from not to and and then to or. So if you look at, at this particular Boolean expression, five is less than seven is true, and then we have the, the sub-expression three is less than two times two, so three is less than four is true. So really what we have is true and true, and the overall result of this expression is true. Here's another sub-expression. 8 is less than 7. That's false, but 4 greater than or equal to 4 is true. So I have false or true. So with the or, if either one of the expressions is true, the whole thing is true. One more is a little more complicated. 8 less than 7 or 4 greater than or equal to 4. So 8 less than 7 is false, but 4 greater than or equal to 4 is true, as we've seen. So that's false or true, so that whole expression on the left is true. So then if we look at the expression on the right, we have true and not 1 greater than 9. So looking at 1 greater than 9, 1 greater than 9 is false, but if then if I negate or not false, that becomes true. So this expression is, becomes true and true, which is true. So overall I had true in this whole long expression, I had true and true, and the entire expression from the earlier slide is true. We can talk about truth tables to your students and discuss the or operator, the and operator, and the not operator by having two particular values, or two, two columns in this case, for P and Q, two represented variables, and enumerate all possible combinations of the two values of true or false across these two operands P and Q. So we'd have four possible scenarios, and if you do this on your own, the P or Q, the only time that P or Q is false is when both operands are false. So the very last line, false or false, the or operator would be true, or would be false only in that case, and true in all the others. It's, it's the opposite with AND. So the only time that 
P and Q is true is when both of the operands are true. So the first line of P and Q is true and all the others are false because as long as one of them is false, the entire expression is false. And then negating or nodding a value, true becomes false and false becomes true. Another operator is the implication operator. And this is true in all cases except the second line here where a true precedent implies a false antecedent. So to think a bit about this a little more, the implication is declared here in this truth table. Think of the expression, if it rains, I will stay at home. So there's four possibilities. It rains is true and I stay at home. So in that case, the very first line there, true and true, that's also true. If it rains and I don't stay at home, this is actually inconsistent with the statement and I lied because it did rain, but I did not stay home. So the second line is the only case here where we have false. And the other two are interesting cases. So it, it doesn't rain and I stay home. Well, the original statement does not say anything about what do I do if it doesn't rain? So the, the original statement only talks about when it does rain or the true value of it raining and me staying home. So for statements three and four, the third and fourth line of the truth table here, it doesn't discuss at all what happens when it doesn't rain. I can either stay at home or I can go outside. Now that we have a basic understanding of the decision structure and relational and logical operators, we'll apply those specifically to creating a new program together. So the next lesson we will explore hands-on a solution to the problem that you see here on the screen. So be thinking about this as we move into the next lesson and just in English express on a pencil with your pencil and paper how you might solve this without worrying about a programming language or SNAP. What's the logic of this solution? So the problem asks to create a SNAP program where we ask the user for a numeric grade from 0 to 100 and our goal is to convert the numeric grade into a letter grade with 90 to 100 an A, 80 to 89 a B, 70 to 79 a C, 60 to 69 a D, and anything lower than 60 an F. So how would you create the logic of this program to take that number and convert it to a letter? So that'll be the focus of our next lesson, which will be a hands-on creation of a SNAP program that will do this.